Recently, I was at a conference at Leicester City to basically do a smaller version of what I was doing at Opta, but the reason why everyone else was there was to listen to some amazing speakers talk about football tactics. In particular, there was a panel Q&A session at the end with the Leicester manager, the Sweden manager, and the England manager, at the end of which Roy Hodgson and I got into a little disagreement about data in football. Some of this was a confusion between predictive and prescriptive analytics and the existence of expected goals models, but I already spoke about lots of criticisms of football stats in my Alan Shiro video, so I won't be talking about those today. Instead, I want to push my ulterior motive on you. I want to work for a national team this summer before I return to club work, so in this video we'll be picking the England squad using numbers. No, not like that terrible Sky Sports Statistical 11, whatever the hell that means, as far as I can tell it's a load of crap, or the Who Scored 11, which consistently picks terrible goalkeepers, no defensive midfielders, uh, and whose highest rated central defender I think is Otamendi this year. Instead, we will just be using some of the best publicly available metrics to pick a squad that won't get thrashed by Slovakia this summer. Let's start with goalkeepers. The two guys that I'd pick other than Joe Hart, based off of nothing other than my eyes, are Fraser Forster and Jack Butland. I think that those guys are going to go to the Euros anyway, but let's look into the data to see if there's something that we don't already know. There's still a huge debate about how important goalkeepers actually are. When Petr Cech went to Arsenal, John Terry said he might be worth 15 points a season to Arsenal. I'm someone that thinks that Petr Cech is fantastic and that Chesney is rubbish, but still I think John Terry misunderstands the trade-off between players. Goal Impact, which I love, thinks that a great goalkeeper on a bad team would be worth roughly six points, whereas Damien Kamali, who brought players like Kolo Torre, uh, Modric and Suarez into the Premier League, says... With the same defenders, with exactly the same shots that we faked last season, if Hugo was in goal for us, we will be scoring 17 points more or 18 points more. I think I'm going to go with goal impact on this one. So take everything that I say about goalkeepers with a large pinch of salt, because the reality is that even after five years of data, save percentage tells us nothing about how good they are long term, and even more advanced metrics don't necessarily give that much information. So what if we compare how many goals a goalkeeper has conceded to how many we would expect them to concede? If we look at the 22 goalkeepers in the data, who have faced more than 350 shots and ask how many goals we'd expect them to concede if they're average, where one is average, uh, versus how many goals they've actually conceded, we can see that Hart and Foster jump out as being much better than Green and Ruddy at shot stopping. If you want to know what expected goals are, it might be worth your time going through some of my previous videos, particularly the Alan Shearer one, but basically uh, goals aren't very good at predicting how good a team will be in future. Shots are a little bit better at predicting it, shots on target are better than that and expected goals are consistently better than any other public measure at predicting how good football teams are. The expected goals of a shot is just the quality of a shot, the likelihood of a particular shot becoming a goal and all of that data that I'm using is from Paul Riley who you should definitely be following using the links below on Twitter because he posts all this data publicly. Butland and Forster are relatively new to Premier League football so if we look at all the goalkeepers who have faced more shots than Butland we can see that Butland and Forster actually jump out as being better than Joe Hart, and Goal Impact, which I'll explain a little bit later in this video, also loves them. Fraser Forster has roughly the 25th highest goal impact in the world right now out of all players because when he plays for a particular team that team becomes better right so when Southampton were really crap at the beginning of the season and Stekel Enberg was playing for them suddenly Fraser Forster comes in they become much better not all of that will be because of him but over a whole career some of that effect will be because of him and that's why his goal impact score is so high. Hart is also something like a top five world goalkeeper by goal impact and whilst Jack Butland measures as being pretty average at the moment he projects to be a very, very good goalkeeper when he's older. This is interesting. It seems like we're picking up genuinely good players, which Roy Hodgson would take to the Euros anyway, which hopefully helps you to trust in the numbers. Next up, defenders. I only want to take seven because I think more midfield and attacking options are probably more useful than more defensive options, and we want to be sticking with a regular back four anyway. And just like before, it's very difficult to tell who is a good defender and who isn't in the numbers because things like tackles and interceptions tell you how a defender defends, but they don't tell you how good they are. I think there are two 
two reasons why it's very difficult to measure defenders in football. The first is, I think it's very plausible that in football attacks dictate the game to defenders. So how good a defender looks, in a very big way, depends on how good the attacks that they've faced are. Secondly, managers and their systems have a huge impact on defences. The reason why it's so difficult to measure defences is that everyone defends differently, so what exactly are we supposed to be measuring? At Klopp's Dortmund, a good defender might need to counter press well, whereas at Leicester City, a good defender might let the opposition come to them so that they can counter attack. Another option is we could ask what area a particular player is responsible for and then see how well the opposition progressed the ball through that area, right? So if the opposition are dribbling around you or passing straight through you, you're maybe not such a great defender, but if they're finding it much more difficult to get past the area that you should be defending, then you're a better defender. There will be some problems with this, like Leicester will be happy letting the opponents progress towards them so that they can then counter attack and possession teams are likely to look slightly overrated but I think it's a pretty good measure. Tom Lawrence's patch model attempts the solution to this problem by asking how good players are at controlling territory. Just like everyone else, you can find his links below. Patch correlates very well with expected goals, because presumably, if the opposition are finding it harder to progress towards your goal, they're going to have slightly worse chances, and we know that expected goals is a better measure of how good defences are than just goals alone. But let's move away from the boring stats theory and get into some actual players, the first of which I think we can all agree Agree on is Chris Smalling. He's the perfect age, has a very respectable goal impact score, the second highest patch of any English defender right now, and whilst this is very system dependent, has been part of one of the best defences in the league. Then I think many of you would agree with me on Phil Jones. He's often mocked a lot, but he controls territory incredibly well, has a goal impact score the same as Chris Smalling, but a higher ceiling because he's younger, and is very versatile. I imagine the other centre backs in Hodgson's mind right now are Jackie L. Kurt Stones and Cahill, but I'm a little bit sceptical of all of them, and I'd like to add Tompkins, Shawcross, and Dan into that mix. I've exaggerated my dislike for John Stones on Twitter just because I think that Everton should have sold him this summer, but he plays for a bad defensive team, doesn't control territory very well, and doesn't have a great impact on his team. So the reason for including him in the squad would be that he could get better in future, and I absolutely agree that could be the case. He is working with a bad defensive manager right now, and he is very young and has a lot of time to get better better, but I don't think it would be detrimental to his development at all to not include him in the national team this summer. Cahill controls territory well, has an okay goal impact, and alongside Jagielka is an England vice-captain, so whatever I say, he will go to the Euros this summer, but I'm a little bit scared that he's on the wrong side of the age curve and doesn't necessarily have the ability to justify his inclusion in spite of that. Jagielka was very good at his peak and hasn't really dropped off that much since then. He's pretty good at controlling territory and has lots of England international experience, which I don't think is to be laughed at, but at 33, this is likely to be his last international tournament, and he's a surprisingly limited defender. Is it worth it? With Shawcross, I'm being a little bit of a hypocrite, because he's also thought of as being a pretty limited defender, and he's not that much younger than Gary Cahill, but he has the highest goal impact score of any active English central defender right now, which means that he makes more of a contribution to Stoke's good performances than any other English defender makes to their teams. Obviously though, this doesn't mean he'll have the same effect in a different side, but Stoke are playing increasingly expansive football. He's surprisingly good with the ball at his feet, and I think he'd offer a very good and very different option to England. Scott Dan is very, very different. His goal impact score is crap, he's clearly reached his ceiling, but his control of territory is pretty good and his attacking numbers are crazy. Lastly, James Tompkins is 26, pretty versatile, able to play in a high line, has a good goal impact score, and controls territory pretty well. So who do you take as third and fourth? I think the strongest arguments could be made for Cahill, Shawcross and Tompkins, but Smalling and Jones can both play right back, so versatility isn't so important, so for that and fitness concerns, I will just about go Cahill and Shawcross. Roy, I don't think I'll be able to fully persuade you on centre-backs, but the picture is about to get a little bit better for full-backs. Just like for centre-backs, we want to look at their overall contribution, their goal impact, and how good they are at defending, how good they are at controlling territory, but we're also going to add some attacking numbers into the mix. Kyle Walker 
Walker is the perfect age, has the highest goal impact of any active English defender, controls territory well, creates a lot of shot assists, and has played a big role in the possible title winners and best defence in the league this year. I think that Walker will be taken, but as a second choice this summer, but I'd seriously consider starting him. Nathaniel Klein has good but worse control of territory, a pretty bad goal impact given his reputation, okay creativity, but again is the perfect age and has started in one of the best defences in the league. For now, I still only want the skeleton of a squad, so I'll put Walker in there and think about the other options later, but let's move on to left backs where I think there are five players you can make a good argument for, none of whom are Leighton Baines. Kieran Gibbs has the fourth highest goal impact for any England defender and by far the highest for left backs, consistently has very, very good creative numbers, but his control of territory is pretty crap, he's not starting games at the moment and his legs could snap at any second. Ryan Bertrand controls territory well, his creative numbers are decent and most importantly, he used to go clubbing with Andre Schürrle and my best friend. Post Sekalenberg, Southampton's defence looks pretty good this year, he's comfortable on the ball and his goal impact is pretty decent. Luke Shaw was the brightest defensive English prospect before his injuries and I don't really think that they've changed that. His control of territory is consistently fantastic, his creative numbers are great and whilst his goal impact is lower than all of the other left backs on this list, it has a much higher ceiling for when he's reached his peak. Aaron Cresswell is fun. He's been part of a West Ham side that for two years have exceeded their expected goals against, although I think that Adrian is a big reason for that. His creative numbers, his shot assists and expected assist numbers are fantastic, but his goal impact is pretty crap and at 26, surprisingly old, there isn't that much room for him to get better. Danny Rose isn't mentioned anywhere near enough for my liking. He has decent control of territory, great creative numbers, a good goal impact and has started regularly for the best defence in the league this year. After looking at the numbers and how surprisingly old he is, I don't really love Aaron Cresswell so much and whilst I think that Luke Shaw is fantastic, there are fitness concerns etc, so I think the question becomes, what do you think of Kieran Gibbs? He's been pretty crap over the last year but there's a lot of historical information to suggest that he's actually very good. So what do you trust? The season or the career? Usually I'd go for the career, particularly when his goal impact is so much higher than all the others, but considering he's had such a crap year plus all of the fragility with his injuries, I'm tempted to not go for him. I'm going to go for what Roy and most of you are probably going for, Rose and Bertrand, although again it's quite tough at left back. Thank you to Mark Thompson, again links in the description below, for his great stylistic defensive profiles that I've stolen. For midfielders we can use the same measures, but we also want to know how many goals we might expect an English midfielder to contribute. I should probably explain goal impact to this point. Basically, goal impact measures how much a player contributes to their team's goal difference when they play, adjusted for who they're playing for, who they're playing against, uh, whether it's home or away, etc. I'm happy to answer any questions in the comments, but basically if a player has a high goal impact score, then we can say with confidence that they are contributing a lot to their team's goal difference when they play, they are making their teams a lot better when they play, and under similar conditions we would expect them to do the same. So now instead of saying that players like Cavani are really good because they score goals, we can see if PSG are worse, the same, or maybe even better without a player like Cavani. And in a similar way, we can ask how Thomas Muller or Sergio Busquets, players who usually are quite difficult to measure, we can ask whether they make their teams better when they play. Back to players. Eric Dyer is definitely going, not least because he's possibly been the most important player in what might be a title winning season for Tottenham. His goal impact looks good, he's got goals in him, and he has the best territory control of any player in his position this season. Deli Ali should also definitely go. He's posting numbers like a young Cesc Fabregas right now with the highest expected goals and expected assist numbers in his position this year for any players with a reasonable number of minutes and he also has awesome goal impact potential. Daniel Drinkwater has zero senior England caps at 26 but I also think that he should be on the plane. Not only does he have very good territory control on a team that are pretty bad at controlling territory, not only is he posting pretty good creative numbers and not only has he been a key part of the most extraordinary team in Premier League history, 
but he's been doing it for his entire career. He has the joint second highest goal impact score of any currently active English central midfielder. Even if he doesn't start, James Milner has to go. He's still starting for an underrated Premier League team, has international experience and is an extremely versatile workhorse. His expected goals and assist numbers are pretty good. He's decent at controlling territory and along with Daniel Drinkwater, he has the second highest goal impact score for any currently active English central midfielder. I need to add at least one more central midfielder, but with Carrick, Henderson and Barkley to choose from, not to mention players like Noble, Shelby, uh, Wilshire and Jack Cork, I think I'll leave that until we filled in a little more of the gaps. On to attacking and wide midfielders, Raheem Sterling is obviously going. He has decent expected goal and assist numbers, a decent goal impact score but with lots of room to grow and is consistently starting for what medium term is probably the best club in the country. As frustratingly average as he can sometimes be, Adam Lallana is also going. His goal impact is very good, his control of territory is strong, as are his expected goal and assist numbers. Wayne Rooney is the current England captain and to my knowledge the only player that Roy Hodgson has said is definitely going to the Euros this summer. I think you could make a reasonable argument for his exclusion but barring injury there's just no chance that that's happening. His goal impact continues to be excellent although this contains information from all over his career and whilst his output has quite significantly declined over the past three or four years his expected goal and assist output is still pretty strong. I'll get some stick for these next two the first of which is I almost don't really want to say it. Theo Walcott. Yes, he's been crap recently, but if we're going to predict who's going to be the best at the Euros this summer, it's more important to think about a career pattern than just the last six months. I appreciate that Lennon and Antonio have been fantastic recently, but there's a lot of recency bias there. Walcott has easily the highest goal impact of any English player right now and a top 15 goal impact ish in the world. When he has played for his teams, the space that he creates and the output that he's produced creates a huge positive impact and his output continues to be strong. He has comfortably the best expected goals for any English wide player and good creative numbers too. Yes, his finishing has been crap lately, but fundamentally it's a more important skill to create fantastic chances and to take really good chances than it is to finish them. This may sound a little bit counterintuitive, but whilst attacking output is roughly stable, the amount of that output that actually ends up in the back of the net today tells us nothing about the amount of that output that will actually end up in the back of the net tomorrow. So fine, Walcott and his teammates finishing has been rubbish, but if we're going to predict who's going to be the best at the Euros, then the very fact that Walcott is getting off those shots and creating those high quality chances is more important. Danny Welbeck should also go to France. His expected goals numbers this season in the tiny amount of minutes that he's played are absolutely incredible and whilst there's a ton of recency bias in there like for Aaron Lennon he's maintained a high goal impact score over two different top clubs Manchester United and Arsenal throughout his career to back that up but my most controversial pick is seemingly an uncontroversial one Ashley Young. He has easily the best territory control of any English player this season, has the highest goal impact score of any wise player and considering he probably won't start, offers a lot of versatility. The reason it's controversial is that I would drop Klein or Walker for him because once you have several centre backs who can play at right back plus Eric Dyer, plus Ashley Young plus James Milner if you get super super desperate I'm not sure the need for a second backup right back is greater than the need for more midfield options. I definitely won't be able to convince Roy of this and I probably won't be able to convince you either but I wouldn't take Nathaniel Klein. Don't get me wrong, I love Nathaniel Klein but I think it's a necessary sacrifice when we're trying to pick the best squad and not just the best players to go to the Euros. That is, unless you're convinced that Klein would be better under Hodgson's tactics than Walker would, in which case fair enough drop Kyle Walker instead. Up front, I won't need to convince anyone of Harry Kane. Penalties are unfairly boosting his goal numbers, but still when you take them out, his expected goal numbers are fantastic. I think it's worth taking Daniel Sturridge too. Yes, he'll probably be injured for the beginning of the tournament, in which case we can take someone else, or he might even get injured during the tournament, but there are only seven players, excluding Messi and Ronaldo, that have managed 20 non-penalty goals over the last two full seasons in world football. None of those players have managed it twice, one of those seven players is Daniel Sturridge. Sturridge is a risk, but I think he's worth it, especially when you have players like Rooney, Walcott, Welbeck, Sterling and Harry Kane to give you some depth up front. And that's it. 
I wouldn't take any other forwards. Part of that is that I don't really think that Vardy or Carroll or Dini or whoever would offer a huge amount more to a squad that already has enough forward options. But the other part is that Jamie Vardy is a racist, and the fact that we all collectively choose to ignore that and just three weeks later call up a guy who has no hope in the future of the England national team to the national squad, in my view, is a national embarrassment, <laughs> but maybe that's a video for another time. So that's pretty much the squad. Hart, Forster and Butland as keepers, with Walker as a right back, unless you can make a fantastic tactical argument for Nathaniel Klein, with Shawcross, Cahill, Jones and Smalling as centre backs, Danny Rose and Ryan Bertrand as the left backs, Kane and Sturridge, unless he's in hospital by that point, as our forward options, with Lalana, Young, Rooney, Welbeck, Walcott and Sterling as our attacking midfield options. But we need one more central midfielder and I'm having real difficulty trying to pick one. Jordan Henderson was almost certainly the best midfielder that I left out of the squad with a very high goal impact score, but he just hasn't looked the same since his incurable foot injury. Michael Carrick, he's playing a very different role and still top level club football, but I think he's declined quite substantially. Ross Barkley is very good, but preferably I'd want someone more conservative. If Henderson would be okay for half of England's games, I'd take him, but otherwise I think you need to face reality and keep him out for now. Michael Carrick, I have to drop for the same reason as Phil Jagielka before, which I guess leaves Ross Barkley. The other option would be to get rid of Ashley Young and replace him with Barkley and a more conservative midfield option, which I think I prefer in terms of the squad, but I'm still sort of clinging on to the hope that Ashley Young is actually good. And I haven't spoken about them today because there isn't enough time, but I would have loved to talk about including players like Ward Prowse, Rodriguez, Stanislas, Johnson, Dawson, Dini, and Chris Martin in the England setup at some point in the future, because they all have impressive numbers. In terms of the actual setup, I think it strongly depends on what the manager wants tactically. I'm tempted to argue that Forster is better than Hart, but I don't think there's nearly enough evidence or good enough stats for that right now, so Hart and goal. In front of that, I definitely like Walker, Jones, Smalling and Danny Rose, although I wouldn't have any complaints about Bertrand instead. Eric Dyer is definitely starting in this team. Danny Drinkwater, every clever person in football I speak to says that he's fantastic, so he's also going to start. I haven't watched Liverpool this season, so I'm tempted to put James Milner in there, but if he's become crap and he's just a utility player, then I guess you have to put confidence in Deli Alley. Kane is obviously playing up front, unless Sturridge has amazing form and fitness over the next two months, and then after that, really, really don't know. Sterling is the most fun. Walcott, I think you'd have to look at a little bit more closely to see if he'd work as a 27-year-old. Uh, Lalana, I still like, and although it's unpopular, I still think that Danny Welbeck would be really useful to the starting 11. So this is the final squad. If you have any comments on the squad or suggestions for swaps that you'd want to do, make sure to write them in the comments below. Whilst you're down there, make sure to check the link in the description where I'm raising money for the most effective charities in the world, allowing you to do the most good for every pound or euro or dollar that you donate. Whether you're Hodgson's PA getting in contact about the assistant manager job or just someone that wants to see the rubbish I post on Twitter and Instagram, those links are also below, as well as all of the other analysts whose work I've stolen in this video. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, and I'll see you for the next video.